All right, so Forward Web Summit. Uh, we've talked a lot about JavaScript in the front end. Um, I've done a lot of that up to a couple years ago, um, basically ending with like Angular 1. And since then, I've been doing a lot of work on the back end. But I still kind of like peek in and watch how things are going and changing. Um, because in a lot of ways, the architecture on the front end is kind of a derivative of what we do on the back end. A couple years into my career, Rails came out. So before that, um, you know, we really had to piece things together, and every project you went to was completely different. And so Rails kind of brought some of that code as people idea that we might have heard a little bit about earlier, which is, you know, make it really easy to do the right thing and really hard to do the wrong thing. Um, and so that, that was kind of, uh, you know, from a design perspective, that was very good. But also from just getting going, zero to blog in 15 minutes, that was like, that was amazing. <laughs> um, because before, you know, you kind of had to set up an Apache server. You had to figure out if you wanted mod PHP or CGI, et cetera. And now you just had this, this thing where you just typed Rails Go and you connected to port 3000 and you wrote a blog. So that's, that's the perspective I'm bringing uh, to this talk. So basically, I work for uh, a company that does PubSub stuff. So I really see lots of use cases, lots of different applications. We have, we have I think, like 80,000 uh, applications running on our network. Um, I do lots of core stuff, so I'm not interacting with customers, but it's you know 80 person teams. So really get to like see what use cases are and like talk with a lot of the architects who work with our customers about what customers are doing with our system, et cetera. I'm not selling any of that. Uh, basically, we do a lot of projects at work. I have a lot of views about how things should be done. Um, Rails brought us this opinionated development thing, at least to web development. Um, and so this is basically something I've put together for the last few weekends and been thinking about for the last two years about like how would you build software that lets you, you know, do a lot of the things we've been talking about today, share code um, across, you know, the different parts of your app. Um, and also, you know, stop working against the stack. Like in a lot of ways we do things like two-way data binding that we have elegant solutions to, but the way that I see kind of the data center going um, and, and indirectly through some of the trends that we're seeing from client libraries, um, you know, things are changing, and I want to explain a little bit about uh, why that is. Um, so, basically, I was going to cover the history in about five minutes, talk about ten minutes about, like, you know, how things uh, look now and how that's influencing the new libraries that are coming out. So, I'll kind of go through this quickly. Um, so we started out kind of in the stone age of development, and there's like no naming system to these ages. It's just like whatever I put together. Um, so we really had prototype, and there's probably a couple things before that, but that gave us the map function, and it gave us the Ajax function. Like um, there was a time not long ago when people hated JavaScript and didn't want to use it in their projects and thought maybe, maybe form, form validation is OK. But otherwise, it's like not really a real language. We can't do anything real with it. Um, and we kind of saw a lot of Flash and Flash intros and you know things like that. Um, and with Prototype came Scriptaculous, which gave us a little bit of like CSS-based animation in the browser. That was pretty legendary. Um, my timelines are a little bit foggy. I, I really spent a lot more time putting together the demo than the slides, so my apologies on that. But um, so jQuery and jQuery UI came out, and those were like much more complete. Those started giving us like the ideas of of uh, components, and let's not repeat ourselves too much. And finally, um, Rails came, and Rails had all of these opinions and uh, a technical stack to build them upon. Like everything was assembled; it was no longer whiteboards and slides and people talking about stuff. It's like here's Rails, like let's. Let's do something cool. So I think it warrants a lot of a lot of thought. I mean, it's it's definitely still relevant and it still solves a lot of uh, the problems that it was designed to solve very well. But it was actually made when JavaScript was uncool. Um, it was made, 
you know, 10, I think uh, this last July, there was a post saying it had been around for 10 years. And that's something that really got me like thinking about this idea a lot. Um, and so like, what is it about the libraries we see now versus the libraries we saw then? Like why, why, why wasn't that good enough? Why didn't we just stay with that and keep going? Um, so, so, you know, Rails came out and, and we also started seeing like a lot of really neat things coming out. We saw like Gmail, which was one of the first like full page applications where you could read your email, you could, you know, do everything without, you know, clicking, clicking the title and waiting for a new page to load. It, it just kind of popped up. And in my view, um, oops. So like also Mebo. Mebo was much more, you could, you could tell um, because of the nature of email, you know, it's still kind of asynchronous. You send it off and maybe a day later you get a response back. But instant messaging in the browser, in my view, was, was that was very game changing. That's when I really started to take the web seriously. Um, I had been doing a lot of Java server faces and things like that. Um, and, you know, it's cool they got the whole request response lifecycle and stuff, but like, what if you don't necessarily need that anymore? Um, so we started seeing a lot of Ajax. Um, and eventually, like, Twitter released Bootstrap, and now we have all kinds of CSS3 and HTML5. But, like, that hasn't always been around. So, um, pretty soon after that, you know, that, this is the span of 10 years. This is probably like five years in. Like, Node came out uh, like 2007 or something. Um, and from there, what really got my attention with Node was you could run JS everywhere. There was this idea of um, isomorphic code. It was like really big in the beginning, but people kind of like, gave up the idea of trying to use the same libraries in the browser and in Node, which was kind of disappointing to me. Um, and, and actually just seeing, uh, seeing that there's two almost identical package managers, Bower and NPM, for example, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of diverging beyond a point I think is acceptable, like given, given all the enthusiasm about isomorphic code in the beginning. Um, there was one very awesome project that did this extremely well. It's the first relevant thing AOL did in my career. Like, um, I got my career started actually as a preteen, making things to like kick people off the internet, like by crashing their IMs. So, like, it, it's kind of cool that I saw this in about 2010. This framework called SocketStream, which actually gave us a lot of what Closure uh, Script does now, which is you had a shared code uh, module. And then you had your server module, your client module, and all the exports sort of mapped um, from the server side into this kind of exposed object on the client side that you could just call and got free RPC. And they were also like very pub sub oriented, message driven. Um, unfortunately, the project seems to have uh, not lasted too long. By 2011 or so, it was gone. Um, so, oh yeah, I had to do a cool because the 80s, um, we're talking like late 80s, Haskell type ideas started coming out. Um, you know, in the, on the kind of like Rails evolved CRUD front, we still had Angular and Ember going, but they're still getting like this really advanced data binding and things like that. Um, exposing a lot of like functional nature, being probably functional inside, but still kind of like hiding it. Um, but on the other hand, we, start, we also have like Elm, BaconJS, um, and D3, which I think are, are interesting for these contributions, which M Elm is like all in. Bacon is sort of like, you want some FRP, you can drop in this library. And D3, it's, it's this completely different thing for graphics domains, but I think it, it brings a lot of cool ideas, um, like um, just reacting to, you know, you got like a loop of, of change and render. You didn't actually write the loop. It kind of handled that machinery for you, so you know, it's, it's not to class it, it's just to say I thought it was, um, you know, a, a significant uh, lot, uh, feature, I guess, of a, a framework to do. So um, now we're in the age of the stream. 
I'm sure marketing would approve of this slide, but I can't help it. There's two paradigms in, in distributed computing. There's shared memory and there's message passing. And I think as uh, that, that's sort of like the driver. We, we talked in the panel earlier about, you know, like concurrency is the killer application for functional programming. Well, yes, definitely true. We've kind of hit that, the edge of progression of single core speeds. We're getting laptops with two, four, eight plus cores. You know, it, it, makes more, it makes a lot of sense to be able to take advantage of these optimizations. So we're doing it. We've been doing it for quite a while longer on the server. And we, you know, we see these pretty, you know, reasonably mature, like streaming frameworks like Spark and Sam, uh, Sam's is pretty new, but it's for doing like huge scale processing of these events that go through um, the back end. And just kind of across the board, um, you know, we see even Amazon instance types kind of turning into, um, you know, like we've got the graphic instance, the compute instance, the memory instance, the disk instance, all of these things mean that you're going to have a bunch of parts of your applications that do different things running on different machines. And um, you know, as a result, we've got all these different API backends. We've got all these load balancers. This is an interesting one. If you've been to the, any of the functional, react, uh, the functional programming talks, I feel like this is worth pointing out because it was kind of alluded to earlier. But these two things end up with the same results. You'll have a, you start with an A array of 0 to 9, a B array of 1 to 10, because um, you're taking everything in A and adding one to it. But these things actually kind of express different things. One, is, one implies more than the other. This one actually implies a serial ordering. You have to do zero to nine in order. So if you've got um, you know, a laptop that has eight cores, you could do that in two or three cycles. But now you actually have to wait 10 still. Um, it's, it's a lot harder to kind of like make this code parallelizable um, automatically. So this is kind of what I mentioned earlier. These are like the properties of these two kinds of systems. So shared memory is where we've been with JavaScript, C, you know, all the imperative class of languages, which is, you know, you've, you've got that array of memory and you're assigning things and it's all, you know, it should be contiguous blocks or maybe linked lists. But um, sort of as soon as you have more data that can fill, um, one machine, you're kind of out of luck. Like, there's some, some offerings in kind of the enterprise space and probably an open source one. I can't remember what it's called. But, you know, it, it offers you kind of a virtual uh, way of sharing objects across Java processes. But, you know, it's, it's sort of like, again, like data binding. It's, it's kind of taking a problem that you shouldn't solve and solving it well. Um, but really, you know, message passing makes a lot more sense. Like, user moves a mouse, that's a stream of events. They click on something, now you have a stream of clicks. Um, you can handle this in various ways. And, you know, you can, you can map it all onto memory segments and use locks and things, or you can kind of do these things as these pure functions that everyone talks about. Um, let's see. So deployment and data centers are changing, automation, Big data, business intelligence, analytics, everyone wants hooks into your applications, everyone wants audit, law, audit trails, everyone wants um, to be able to maybe recreate uh, scenarios for bug reports, et cetera. Event-driven systems let you just record this stuff and offers it all out of the box. Um, you know, I, we've got alcohol after this, I'll talk all night about this stuff to you if you want a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, this is a very interesting finding. Network and disk access are e basically equivalent in terms of uh, latency in the modern data center. That's like extremely profound. It means, you know, they're both very fast. Um, I see about 125 megabytes per second matching when I run like a Kafka server. Um, so, you know, and, and I had mentioned like the different instance types. I know I'm over time. I'm just kind of like trying to get to my conclusion as fast as possible. Um, <laughs> so I also do a lot of like reading about business stuff. So we've got these new ideas like Lean Startup, Continuous Delivery, Jez Humble um, wrote this awesome book. It's kind of like the Bible of how software is deployed. None of it really matches the single machine model that we've been working with for so long. So you know, you're gonna have an influx of new tools as well that you're gonna be working with. Um, I do see this concluding in business and engineering are talking better, like this is all you know, software is people, so all of, 
you know, you've got these engineering solutions like functional programming, business solutions like agile, lean, and then kind of things that say like, okay, this is what we have. Let's maybe define a, a, an interface that we can work together with. Um, so how do we respond? Kind of take the right path um, architecturally. I really wish I could have talked more about specifics. Um, one thing I, like kind of the point of this, I open sourced a project today that's kind of demoing a lot of these ideas based on closure everywhere, blah, 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 drank the Kool-Aid a couple years ago. And uh, I wanted to share that. So senior developers have special roles on teams. Um, in my view, like there, there has to be at least one forward looking person on every team. That's why we're all here. Um, because otherwise you just kind of see like really stagnant apps, especially if you go into a company that, you know, kind of has a lot of, um, a lot of old code. You just see it just piles of, of crap and no one really knows how to fix it or if they do, um, you know, they, they don't have the clout to within their organization. So, you know, some organizations are better than others, like especially being in like a, a te technology software as a service type company, we have a lot of room to like experiment with these things and our technology is our business value, so business is very inclined to listen to us. Um, so, you know, we've got a lot of room there to experiment with things um, where you wouldn't be able to if it was kind of like a web agency or something and your clients had very small budgets. I was gonna talk a little bit about the choices I made. I actually, have, I've got a pretty big readme for the project, so you guys can find it all there. Um, it's here, Harlanji slash closure seed. Uh, it mostly works, like it kind of broke a little bit today and I checked it in, it's broken, so if there were CI it would be failing, sorry. Um, like I said though, it's like a weekend project, so it, that's gonna be the state of it. But, you know, I actually, it's, it takes a lot of things that Java did very well and takes them without throwing the bathwater out. Um, so I just wanna like, gonna keep kind of developing that more and using it for myself. If you like Clojure, uh, you should definitely check it out. There's a lot of cool stuff. Um, I can show you more later, I'm way over time. So thanks everyone. <laughs>